Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. John's. Fifty days after the Passover was a harvest festival called Pentecost. Um, we are also celebrating that. Um, it was a, a harvest for a very different reason, a, a harvest of souls, as we see um, in the church here and in the Bible. Um, today, we're going to be celebrating that, and we're going to see kind of unpack some of that as well in our service. We're also blessed to have seminarian Joel Shawee with us today, sharing, sharing a message as well. Uh, if you don't mind taking a minute or so just to fill out one of those connect cards in your pew, and then when the offering plate comes around at that time, you can place those right into the offering um, plate. We begin with our opening hymn. <laughs> Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, or discipline me in your wrath. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am faint. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are in agony. Eternal Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. Jesus said to his disciples, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people, and kindle in us the fire of your love. Hallelujah. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful 
and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all that we need in life and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, God and Lord, come to us this joyful day with your sevenfold gift of grace. Rekindle in our hearts the holy fire of your love, that in a true and living faith we may tell abroad the glory of our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Father, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading comes from Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 to 14. Here the Lord allows the prophet Ezekiel to see that the Holy Spirit would give his words the power to raise the dead to life. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. 
I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and when, when I bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle, settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken. And I have done it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading comes from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. The day of Pentecost was the fulfillment of God's promise to pour out his spirit. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. 
They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each, each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen, listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand. Our gospel comes from chapter 15 and also verse 16, or chapter 16. Here Jesus promised that he would not leave us alone, but he would send us the Holy Spirit of truth to give us the courage and power to testify to the world. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. None of you asks me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Christ. You may be seated.
Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for our sermon for this morning comes from Mark chapter 4. He also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. And as soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. Again he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable should we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, what do you know about gardening? Maybe you feel like you know a lot. Maybe you enjoy getting your garden going every spring. You know exactly what types of materials and fertilizers you need to buy from the store. And you even know what type of work to expect, like trimming and digging and weeding. Or maybe you don't really know much about gardening at all. You've never really seen a flower bed or a gardening hoe or pruning shears. And if you were tasked to take care of someone else's garden, you would surely be fired very quickly for killing all of their plants. But whether you know a lot about gardening or just a little bit, Jesus invites you today to learn from him about how his garden works, how his kingdom works. But instead of making sure that you know what a till is or how to weed a flower bed, Jesus just wants you to learn one important truth, and that is that God makes his kingdom grow. He's the one who does all the work, and those plants grow much larger than you might expect. Jesus' first parable explains how God's kingdom grows. Jesus says, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. Here's the first lesson. The seed grows on its own. It's not the farmer who grows the seed. The farmer just goes to bed. He doesn't even really know how the seed grows. It just does. Dear friends, did you know that you... Our farmers? Any time that you talk about Jesus, you are spreading the seed. You are being a farmer. Any time that your pastor gets up in front of church and preaches the word of God to you, he's being a farmer. Just like a farmer has seeds to plant, so do you. You have the word of God, you have the gospel. And that's exactly what this first parable is talking about, isn't it? Christians spread the seed, they talk about Jesus, the gospel, and God's kingdom grows. But it's not about you. It's all about God. God is the one who makes that seed grow. And aren't there so many times that you need to hear that? That God is the one who makes the seed grow? Maybe there was a time that you were just stressed out and you were afraid, weighed down with anxiety when you maybe wanted to say something about Jesus to someone. You know, I'm, I'm there, 
I know what God's word says. I know that they need to hear this, but maybe they'll think it's dumb. Maybe it won't make sense. I don't quite know how to spin the words just right. I don't know how I can make this message attractive. I don't know how to, to add something, perhaps, to it to make them believe it. But we need to remember our place in all of this, don't we? God says to trust him. So why do we doubt? God says that he is the one who makes the seed grow. So why would we ever put ourselves in God's position thinking that we're ever going to make anything happen on our own? It was never about you. Trust God. Trust his seed to work. There's no special fertilizer. There's no miracle grow that you can buy to make this growing process happen. God's word is powerful enough on its own. It's like if I were to ask you, what's the best way to defend a lion that's locked in a cage? And you would say, well, you let it out. You don't need to add anything to that lion's power. It can defend itself on its own. And in a similar way, God gives you a lion at your disposal. And he wants you to trust that lion to do its thing. Trust the word. The word that God speaks of in Isaiah 55 when he says, My word will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and will achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Trust that message that the Apostle Paul speaks of in Romans 1. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. The power of God. The gospel. That message of sins forgiven. That message of a Savior who came for all to die for all and to give all the free gift of eternal life. That message of a God who loves you and who gave himself up for you. That's the lion. That is power. You can thank God today for giving you this power in your life. Thank God that his seed doesn't get any better by what you can add to it. You farmer. Just trust. So the seed grows on its own, but Jesus has another parable to tell. But instead of focusing on who makes the seed grow, this time Jesus wants you to know just how big those plants can get. He continues, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. I don't know if you've ever seen a mustard seed before, but they are in fact quite small. If you would scoop some mustard seed up and hold them in your hand, it would essentially look like you're just holding grains of sand in your hand. So how can something so so small and so insignificant grow into something so big? They say some trees can even grow up to 20 feet tall where you can just stand stand at its roots and look up, stand under the branches. But you know, the Bible tells a number of stories that demonstrate this very thing. That big and insignificant, big and significant things can come from small and ordinary beginnings. How about the prophet Jonah? Do you remember Jonah? God said to Jonah, go to Nineveh, that big capital city, city of Assyria, and you need to tell them that they are sinning and they need to repent for all the bad things they do. 
And so Jonah got afraid. This seemed like too big of a task. And he ran away, and he got swallowed by the big fish. And eventually he made his way to Nineveh, and he preached God's message. And it says that the entire city, from the greatest in power to the least, believed God. It said that they all put on sackcloth and repented. One man preaches to an entire city, and they all repent? Again, amazing. Or how about the day of Pentecost, like we heard in our second reading for today? The Holy Spirit makes himself visibly known with tongues of fire and a violent wind. People start talking in other languages. And when some people start to murmur about how maybe these men have just had too much to drink, Peter stands up, he addresses the crowd, he clears the air, tells them that they need to repent, and it says that 3,000 people repented and were baptized that day. 3,000 people. But that's what God's word can do. And we can even see some amazing things happening today, too, can't we? Who would have ever thought that that small group of Christians at the beginning of the New Testament church, about 120 people, who would have thought that they would have turned into what we know as Christianity today? Billions of Christians have lived since then. Or how about all the amazing work that our own synod is doing all around the world in places like Vietnam, South America, and Europe? But you know, sometimes results seem a little hard to come by, don't they? You don't have to do too much digging to find Christianity critics out there who love to just point out all the numbers about how much Christianity is dwindling. For example, the Pew Research Center in a recent survey says that since the early 90s, the percentage of Americans who identify as Christian has dropped from 90% to 64%. And even in our own church body, pastor and teacher vacancies, churches and schools closing, these are all constant points of discussion, aren't they? Maybe you have even had some troubling times in your own past experiences that you can think of. And it's at times like those when it would be really easy to doubt God, wouldn't it? He says that the results will be great. And so when we don't quite see those results, we get frustrated, we get disheartened, and we doubt that God's promises are even real. Where are those 20-foot-tall mustard trees, God? I don't really see much happening in my life at all. But the truth is that you don't have to look very far. What if I told you that you were one of those 20-foot-tall mustard trees. That's right, I'm looking at an entire forest of mustard trees right now. How can you know that Jesus is telling the truth with this second parable? That even the most small, ordinary looking things can accomplish great miracles? Because the greatest miracle of all time has happened to you. God has worked faith in you, a faith which transformed a cold and dead sinner into being a saint. And now when he looks at you, he sees a forgiven and a holy child bought with the precious blood of Jesus, who came and lived a perfect life for you, who 
who died in your place, who rose from the dead and is preparing a place in heaven for you right now. This transformation is evidence that great things can happen from small and ordinary things. Believe it. Trust that the Holy Spirit continues to work through the word to strengthen the hearts of Christians on earth. After all, the greatest thing that you could ever imagine is now yours, eternal life with God. So what do you know about gardening? Well, it turns out you know quite a bit. You know that you are working with the best seed possible. And you know that that little seed, it does much more than you might expect. Continue to trust the power of the word until one day when we will be there at the final harvest where Jesus will return to gather all of his own to be with him forever. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue with the prayer of the church. Praise to you, Holy Spirit. We worship you as the Lord and adore you as the giver of life. As you were present at the beginning of the world to give life to all created things, and as you enlightened and equipped the disciples on the day of Pentecost by the baptism of fire, so by the baptism of water with the the word, you made the light of faith shine in our hearts to know Jesus as our Lord. We confess. I believe that I cannot, by my own thinking or choosing, believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. Holy Spirit, Spirit of truth, and source of all spiritual gifts, stand by us in the weakness of our sinful nature. Grant us a right understanding of the truths that Jesus taught. Give us strength to endure with patience whatever afflictions God may send into our lives. Help us, intercede for us, and train us that we may pray to the Father with boldness and confidence. Preserve us by the power of your word in our most holy faith as members of the church, the body of Jesus. In this Christian church, he daily and fully forgives all sins to me and all believers. Holy Spirit, you comfort and counsel us in every need. In dark and difficult days, strengthen our feeble hands, steady our weak knees, and encourage our fearful hearts. Today we especially pray for Rebecca Armin's mother, Ellen, who is in the hospital with health difficulties and may need to go into hospice care. Bless the medical staff and all supporting staff who attend to Rebecca's mother. Grant wisdom and peace for her family as difficult decisions need to be to be made. We also pray in thanksgiving with Charlie and Sandy Eads and Paul and Susan Gorel, who are celebrating wedding anniversaries. We give you thanks, Lord, as they celebrate their anniversaries. By your grace, they have come this far, and by your grace, they move forward together. Sustain and defend them through all trials and temptations. As they enjoy your gift of marriage, help them to love each other with selfless and selflessness and service. May they continue to find comfort in your presence, strength through your promises, and perseverance because of your faithfulness. We also pray for those who were assigned from Martin Luther College to be teachers and staff ministers in our schools and congregations. 
Also, we pray for those who will be assigned from Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary this week to serve as pastors. Ascended Savior, Lord of the Church, hear our prayer for all whom you call into the public ministry. Satisfy them with your rich and heavenly gifts. Cause your people to honor and respect them in their calling and to support them as those whom your Holy Spirit has made stewards of your word and sacraments. Prosper their teaching and preaching of your word among us so that we may grow in faith, wisdom, and good works. And support us with the promise that in your final creative act, you will raise up our bodies so that together with all believers, we may see and enjoy the glorious return of Jesus Christ. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. Amen. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Come, Holy Spirit, renew our hearts and kindle in us the fire of your love. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the offering. At this time, you can also place your Connect card into the offering plate. We'll also be watching The Wells Connection. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. By God's grace, enrollment at our 28 area Lutheran high schools is up across our synod. With that comes exciting opportunities, especially considering a good portion of that growth is from unchurched families. Here's the story of one of those families. Hi, Eve. Welcome to Kellen Ray Lutheran High School. Hi, nice to meet you. It's so great to have you here. Thanks. When Eve Mankey was considering a high school for her daughter, it was important to her and her husband, Joel, to find a school with traditional Christian values. We had started in a public school, and then after seeing what is taught in public schools, we decided to go to a private school. After a simple Google search, Kettle Moraine Lutheran High School in Jackson, Wisconsin, was the first school on Eve's list to tour, and it quickly became the only school they visited. I thought this would be such a great setting to have our kids in because they would be learning academics, which is super important, but they would also be getting the values that are, we thought were so important for them to get reinforced pretty much every day at Kettle. So if we go around the corner here, the Mankeys were so impacted by Kettle Moraine Lutheran High School that they relocated to the area so that their children could attend. They were already looking to make a move, as Joel had recently lost his job due to COVID, and the area around Kettle Moraine Lutheran High School seemed like the right place for them. We felt comfortable and confident that Kettle would be teaching them the things that they should be learning and that they wouldn't be sneaking in stuff that we were not comfortable with. The first thing that people typically say is, man, people are really nice around here. And obviously that is a takeoff from the work that we do and the belief that we have in our Savior. It's the character that we teach, that we expect from one another. And people are drawn to that. When they see people living differently than the world around them, they're drawn to that safe, loving place. Do you keep this in mind with everything that you do? With As a result, Kettle Moraine Lutheran High School has been experiencing growth in its enrollment averaging 17 new students per year for the last decade. And this growth isn't unique to Kettle.
It's an overall trend in area Lutheran high schools across our church body, as the Wells Commission on Lutheran Schools recently reported at their annual conference. Area Lutheran high schools have risen by over 10.8% in the last five years. Um, we have just seen a growth of both Wells members and members of the community who in the past maybe didn't value a secondary Christian education as much as they do today. With that growth comes great opportunities. One, to encourage more young people to study for the public ministry at Martin Luther College. With the greatness of increases in, in enrollment, there's also a bit of a, of a caution there, and that is, are we able to keep up and provide the workers necessary to be able to keep up with this opportunity? And that's where we come in. The members of our congregations, uh, the called workers, to encourage those kids, those fewer kids, um, in considering, could you do that? Could you go out and share Jesus in a full-time way in a congregation, in a school, in an early childhood program? And the second opportunity? To connect unchurched families to their Savior through the gospel in word and sacraments at a nearby Wells congregation, which is exactly what happened with the Mankeys, who were also looking for a grade school for their two younger daughters. And once they moved to the Hartford area, I said, hey, you got to check out Peace Lutheran. They got a great staff over there, a great congregation. You're going to be fed with God's word every single week. So, and that's what they did. And uh, the rest is history. They're members there now. They're so happy. And it's just, uh, it's amazing how the Lord worked that all out for them. Peace Church, it, like when I'm there, I feel at peace. Taking the time to write down so that, be it the administrative assistance, a pastor in religion class, the shop teacher, that they all know and understand their role in how to connect those families with the local congregation. There is an absolute truth. We are told what it is in the Bible. That truth doesn't change. And that's actually a big comfort when you know that there is an absolute truth. If you're teaching that to your kids, you want your school teaching that to your kids too because that's where they are all day long. The Mankey's story is one where we can see God's gracious plan unfolding right in front of us, working by his spirit through Christ's gospel, shared by an area Lutheran high school and its people. And if you noticed, it didn't take much, just an opportunity from the Lord and a simple invitation. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should give thanks to you, Almighty Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day kept his promise and poured out the Holy Spirit to empower his church to proclaim the gospel in all the world. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you, 
Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please stand. This true body and blood strengthen you and preserve you into life everlasting. Go in peace, your sins are forgiven. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. O Lord, we give you thanks and praise that you have restored us as your own children and brought us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. By your Holy Spirit, use us to serve your purpose in this life and bring us to rest in your grace and death when we shall behold your glory and see you face to face. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Glad you could join us here for worship. Special thank you to our seminarian, Joel, for, for sharing God's message as well here today. Um, just a couple of announcements. We are continuing our Bible study. Um, the, the story, uh, this is going to be our last The Story uh, Bible class of the year, I guess you could say, of the school year. Um, we're going to be taking kind of a summer break from that. We'll be having a summer Bible class, but then we'll pick up with the story again, with well, I guess it'd be chapter 23 in the, in the fall. Um, and so this summer we'll be doing a Bible, uh, a Bible class on the Lord's Prayer over the, the summer months. Speaking of summer, we are going to be having our summer Bible camp. You may know of it as Vacation Bible School. Um, the registration is open for not only for those attending, but also for those volunteering. And we need lots of help in order to get this thing running efficiently and well. We need lots of help. So if you could please register, that would be so amazing because we still are in desperate need of some assistance with that. So you can register right with, if you just want to use your QR code, or you, I think you can also go through the uh, St. John's website. Uh, the service times are going to be changing over the next couple of weeks. So special weekend, next weekend, Memorial Day weekend, there are no Saturday service. There's not a Saturday service or Monday service, sort of that, like just Sunday. And then the week after June 2nd, there'll be Sunday services. And then that's when we start for the summer, the, the Monday night service at 630. So no Saturday night services during the summer. Um, there, yesterday, um, kind of as was mentioned briefly in the Wells Connection, um, but yesterday was Martin Luther College's assignment and, and call day, um, and we at St. John's received one graduate. Well, I guess, I guess it wasn't a graduate. It was a reassignment, maybe, is how we might describe it. So, Michaela Isabel, she was already here for two years. But her husband uh, went vicaring last year. That's his intern year during the seminary year. So she went along with him, and now she's back in the Milwaukee area, so we get her for one more year. So we are excited to, to have that. And along that, that same line, as, as was mentioned in the Wells Connection um, and with the assignment day and, and call day, we still need teachers and pastors. So if you know kids or, or anybody, even a second career person, like might be interested in becoming a pastor or teacher, let them know. Um, I went to Kettle Moraine Lutheran High School in, in Jackson, and it was some of my teachers in high school and my, my uh, Latin teacher who said that maybe I should consider going into the ministry. So that was sort of the reason. So you, you never know the, the impact that you, you might have in encouraging um, someone to go into the ministry. Yeah, yeah, here I am. Here I am. <laughs> and then finally, this is just a note that uh, Sam Zacharias' funeral is today. Um, the, the visitation is from 3 to 5, and then the, the actual funeral service will be at 5 o'clock tonight. 
I believe that's all I have. God's blessings on the rest of your day as we celebrate the, the impact that God has made in our lives and that, that we get to, to share that as well with the people in our lives. Have a great day.